Uh, okay, logic. We've been through this a zillion times. Um, first order logic, we got things. Quantifiers. The things after a quantifier, that's a variable. A quantifier is the way you introduce a variable. So, you know, every programming language has the way you introduce these are the variables. Well, that's some first order logic. It's the thing right after the quantifier. Uh, and um, that's a for all, and that's a there exists. And those are the only two quantifiers you have in first order logic. Okay, so uh, we wrote down a bunch of these. All crows are black. I remember we did that. Dolphins are animals. We did that one. Uh, I don't think we did this one last time. No. Who wants to do this one? Dylan. Everybody loves someone. Everybody loves someone. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Everybody loves someone. It's not on the slides. No oh well, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> you might have to get out your pen. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Everybody loves somebody. For every person matters. For all, for it's all. not a for every. There's a for all. For all persons matters. For all what? Persons matters. For all person. For all a. For all a. Is person A? Sorry, we need a connective after a after a uh, predicate. And and there exists. Shh. Yeah, you're right. Not all A are people. So you're about to say for everything. It's a person and something. Let's just leave that out. No, it's a person's question. It's a question? What? We don't have questions if in first order. Oh, then. So you, it's an implication, you mean. For all A, is person A implies there exists a B. Is person B... And well, loves A, B. OK. Does everyone understand this? Um, for each person, there exists someone that that person loves. And that's very different than saying, there exists a B for all A loves A, B which means like B is like the Backstreet Boys or something, and everybody loves them. Like there's one person whom everyone loves. So this, this is a little bit more intuitive, the, the one that Dylan was having us do, where for each person, there is someone that that person loves, you know, like their mother or something, uh, or who knows whom. Okay, so, so the order in which the quantifiers go is really important, right? There exists, for all is very different than for all A, there exists a B, loves A, B. Everybody got that? That's going to be crucial to what comes next in class. Adam, you cool? Okay. All right, Mary likes the color of one of John's ties. What do we got going for that, Adam? Oh, you want to get fancy? You want to get, you, you want to, how about, how about instance of <laughs> T tie? T is a tie. There's a constant tie that represents the, oh. <laughs> there exists a constant tie that is like the class of ties, and T is an instance of it. <sighs> Super fancy. Okay. And uh, belongs to T. John. Likes Mary. Color of T. Wow. Okay. Does everyone get that? I'm sorry, the writing is a little small. 
There exists a T. Mary likes the color of one of John's ties. Yeah, perfect, perfect. Dan. Yeah. Yeah, you could. Would that be completely antithetical to the entire combinatorial nature of symbol systems? Yes. <laughs> Have you ever seen someone write Java as if it's Fortran? In Fortran, there's no dynamic memory allocation. You specify at the top of your program the dimensions of all your arrays, because that's the data structure you've got. <laughs> it's like MATLAB, but even worse. Yeah, so, and people who grow up with Fortran are like, they can write everything, like it doesn't matter what the programming language is. The, here's the array, here are my statements, boom, 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 boom. Like subroutine calls were like added to Fortran, like woo, <laughs> recursion, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Only in Fortran 90 can you, I, I, in Fortran 77, I don't know if you can do recursion. Uh, anyway, if you're just doing physics, it's fine. Um, but uh, since you're just writing matrix math, it's okay. But for AI programming, I don't think it's so good. Um, so yeah, you can take a language and abuse it. Absolutely, you can. Please don't. Be responsible. Don't drink and knowledge engineer. <laughs> um, uh, oh yeah, friends don't let friends write predicates that look like that. Yeah, I can't hold more than one thing at a time. Can't hold more than one thing at a time. How can we write that down? I'm going to get a fresh sheet of paper for this one. can't hold more than one thing at a time. <sighs> yeah, forget about the person thing. Not a big deal. Lee's got his hand up. How about I can only hold one thing? So when I'm in Jack Hold Zero, I can't do anything but one thing. Yes, sir. Not be a, or that, well, I'm just saying that you can specify the complete or partial of. Uh, also implies not holding by a B. Well, it depends. Maybe we don't care. Maybe we're not. I mean, we, we, we could just assume that you won't be holding something that's not a thing. Right. Yeah, so I feel that Congress holds our personal liberties in their clutches. <laughs> See, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, the people in the gallery hold the tomatoes. <laughs> okay. Okay, I'm holding, if I'm holding A, that implies that for everything that's not A, I'm not holding it. That's terrific. Now, uh, this little predicate here equals, some people find that really useful. So some logics build it in. Because it's kind of painful to say, like, uh, the theorem proof you're going to write for assignment two, I'm not, you don't have to do it with equality built in. So you're going to have to say, if you want to say something like this, as far as the theorem prover con is concerned, you know, it doesn't know anything about this predicate unless you tell it. So you're going to have to say equal I, I, you know, equal tomatoes, tomatoes, you know, for every possible thing. I guess you could say for all X equals X equal X, X. That's, that'd be, that's handy. Um, 
But then you have to say um, not equal. Here, this is the painful part. Not equal I tomatoes. I mean, depending on who you are, but um, uh, etc. for everything. Uh, and so some people like to build equality in to the theorem prover, to into the logic itself. Um, so just so you know, the book has a little paragraph about, I think it's called paramodulation, which is what you have to do if you build in equality, but we're not going to touch that, so no fears. Put in parentheses. Oh, right around here? If you wanted to like put one here, you know, like that? Yeah, that's fine. Now, notice you're not going to have to parse anything like this. I'm going to give you CNF. That's not CNF. That's a wolf. That is a well-formed formula. Uh, it is not CNF. So we're going to have to talk about CNF in a sec. Why is first order logic so awesome, beside the fact that it's wonderfully combinatorial? Because you can say all kinds of really crazy things. You can say stuff, you can start to talk about things you don't even know anything about. And that is wonderful fun, let me tell you. Um, indirect knowledge, like John's mother is tall. I don't even have a clue who she is, but I do know that she is tall. And so you can write that in your logic, which is really handy. Because um, then you can reason about John's mother without even knowing who she is. It's very handy. Um, you can say, you can talk about false things. There are a bunch of different knowledge representation languages that were created at the beginning of AI where um, you could only talk about things that existed. <laughs> and that's really a drag. Um, so uh, to be able to talk about things that are false is, is really important. Um, we might come back to this in a month or so. Um, partial knowledge, like disjunction, like a is either the sister of B or C, but I'm not sure which one. That's very handy. Like, you know, Osama bin Laden is hiding here or here or here. You might be able to want to say things like that uh, and then rule some of them out by inference. Um, what's our favorite inference rule, by the way? No, not modus ponens. How are we going to resolve this question? Hmm. Okay, and plus you can also talk about indefiniteness, like, you know, sister of X, A, there exists an X. A is somebody's sister, but I don't know who. Mod, it's a quantifier. 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 It's saying how many. And this means like at least right. one. Ooh, wow. Oh, wow. I'm probably not qualified to answer that question. Wars. I mean, if, if X is defined as B or A, it's saying the same thing as B or C. Can variables in first order logic refer to objects for which there are no constants? I think they can. So I think it's they're not equivalent. If you want to get really down and dirty, um, I think they're not equivalent. I'm a little shaky on this, and I wasn't planning to talk about it today. But um, when we start talking about the semantics of first order logic, um, again, there are these things called possible worlds, but they're a little more complicated than in propositional logic. Instead of just a possible world having to do with whether the propositions are true and false. A possible world includes, as part of it, uh, also comes free with uh, designations for all the symbols in the logic. Um, so every constant has an associated object in the universe of discourse that it points to. And there's no constraint that, say, all the constants don't point to the same object or anything like that. A possible world can, uh, the symbols can, the constants can point to anything. So I think it's entirely possible that there could be objects to which no constant will point. 
and those objects, the quantifiers, like there exists, still range over those objects. So the quantifiers are not over the constants, they're over the objects in the universe. And some of them might be unnamed. Yeah, so I, I think it's not quite true. It's a fine first cut, um, but technically I think that's not quite true. <laughs> 